Firstly, uh, thank you very much for inviting me up here, uh, Alicia, and um, thank you for the sponsors for putting on these great events. Today, I'm going to, um, basically what interested me in Agni was that the, the, the structural style of the deposits is so different in such a small area. And um, so I'd like to talk about that, but also relate it back to the regional events that we see in Agnew, um, just so we can see the, the whole picture of the deformation and mineralisation. The Agnew district, Agni region up here is about 350 kilometres north um, of Kalgoorlie and it's basically, you've got a, a greenstone sequence that's pretty similar to the Kalgoorlie sequence. If you're familiar with Kalgoorlie, it's pretty similar. Um, you've basically got the your basal uh, sequence of mafic and ultramafic units like we have in Kalgoorlie overlaid by sort of felsic, um, clastic um, sequences uh, and then the, the younger unconformably overlying lake basins. So again very similar to Kalgoorlie so it's it's familiar territory for you. So we have um, there's our mafic ultramafic sequence wrapping around the Lawler's anticline which is sort of wrapping over this uh, Agnew granitic complex which is a sort of just a large composite dome. Um, we have uh, a younger clastic sequence that sits on top the Vivian sequence in the Mount White syncline and then we have the younger sequence, uh, the Scotty Creek Basin, which is one of our late basins, um, similar age to the Marugal Formation. So in brown there, you know, you see these all over the eastern gold fields that are unconformably overlying um, our greenstone sequences. And the major structures in the area, we have uh, the major Warunga Shear that forms the uh, western boundary of the greenstone sequence, and it pretty much uh, loosely links up with the Ida Fault that we see down here. So it's not exactly the same but it's close enough. We have the emu shear that marks the boundary of the Scotty Creek or the Lake Basin formation along here and then we have a number of uh, large uh, sort of D3 shears that comes through here. We have the Leinster anticline, the Mount White syncline and then the Lawler's, Lawler's anticline. So the whole greenstone sequence is folded into this series of upright folds. Now um, the main deposits in the Agnew district, we have, uh, there's the Warunga mine and New Holland. They're the two operating mines that Goldfields operate at the moment. But other deposits include Redeema, Crusader, Songvang, uh, McCaffrey's, Vivian, Great Eastern and Fairylands. So there's a lot of gold in this district. It's, it's a well um, mineralised system. But we'll talk today about um, Warunga and New Holland, and I'll also touch briefly on Songvang, just to give us a flavour of what these deposits look like. There's the Warunga deposit and New Holland. They're only two kilometres apart, and they're at the same elevation, but structurally they are so different. Um, Warunga, and this is what struck me when I first saw these deposits, so it, it just got me thinking, it's like, how can you have a deposit like this at Warunga, where it's all layer parallel shears, very ductile, you see these uh, boudinage porphyry bodies right beside the shears. You go across to New Holland and instead you have these flat uh, brittle loads cutting across vertical beds. It's basically the chalk and cheese. And when you look in detail, the quartz in the loads at Warunga is completely refolded and recrystallized. It's, it's just completely ductally deformed. And you go to the, you look at the quartz in the New Holland mine, nothing has happened to it. It's dropped out and it sits there. And you can see it's just beautiful textures of breccia and there's no deformation. So again, it's telling us there's something very different in these deposits. So that's when I sort of started thinking, okay, well, what's happening in this district? So that's, I'm going to take you through now uh, what we're seeing in the regional deformation sequence. Basically right through the eastern gold fields, no matter um, whose scheme you use, that D2 event where we, we squash the whole eastern gold fields and form those upright folds and that actual planar uh, steep north trending foliation, that's the best sort of linchpin if you like for um, working out what's relatively earlier and later. And that's the one I've used as a regional mapper that through the eastern gold fields it's a very consistent uh, pattern. So it doesn't matter which scheme you use, as long as you sort of line it up on that D2 event, that's the thing to do. And it is 
is your deformation before that or is it after it? That's the easiest way to cope with your um, deformation sequences. I'll take you through some field examples of each of those events. Um, but the first event, DE, um, it's just basically the initial extension. If you like, uh, where you're opening your basins, you're depositing your mafic and ultramafic sequences and your clastic sequences. Um, but it's, there's no fabric forming. And that, from original uh, Case Swagger's work, um, basically I like that scheme because there are very hard faults to measure in the field after you've squashed everything. So I like the deformation scheme that Swagger uses um, because he basically, his D1 to D4 are actually based on structures that you can measure. So that's why I leave all that early extension to DE and then, then I'll start with my D1 fabric. So I'll, I'll take you into D1 now. What we see at Agnew, um, basically you remember the, the Agnew granitic complex, wrapping around that granite, granite is a layer parallel foliation, S1 foliation. You guys will see it really well in the Leonora area as well. It's, it's, a, it's a layer parallel foliation. We see it throughout the eastern gold fields. It's, and it's associated with uh, re early recumbent folds. So the, the foliation is axial planar to those recumbent folds. And you often, in Agnew, you'll see a mineral lineation on that surface, um, generally plunging gently to the north. On the, in the, uh, the top, the carapace of the granite, the foliation's well developed, but as you go into the granite, it disappears. So it's a sort of a superficial uh, fabric. And this is a good example here. Um, you've got the, there's the S1 foliation. It's near the top of the granite on the eastern limb where it's very shallow dipping. And you get these mafic roof pendants just floating on top of the granite there. And that S1 foliation is just sort of running off the granite. What we also see is that the S1 foliation is folded by upright F2 folds. It's a very consistent relationship. And you actually see this all the way through the eastern gold fields. So it's, it's actually very consistent. Um, in addition to that sort of S1 foliation that wraps around the granites, you also see these um, D1 shears. And they're sort of up to about three metres thick, um, and they also sort of um, mantle the granite. Um, and they have really well-developed uh, mineral lineations, and they are cut by steep sinistral shears, which I would probably put in as D3, those, those um, north-northwest trending shears. So you see that nice uh, cross-cutting relationship. So that's th those are the sort of things that you see on the eastern margin of the granite, because that's very shallow dipping. But the western margin of that Agnew granitic complex is quite steep. Um, it can be vertical in places, but generally it's about 60 to 70 degrees dipping to the, to the west, if you keep that in mind. And along that contact, we also see a very well-developed S1 foliation all the way through those units, sort of on that western side. And what we see uh, in the, with the S1 foliation it's, it's basically, we see a west side down kinematics. So we're seeing sort of pretty much extensional. Uh, so if you think of the east, it's, it's the, the edge of the granite, that's the edge of the Scotty Creek Basin. We're seeing all of those rocks going down. And where, where you do see uh, mineral lineations, it's pretty rare on that fabric. They generally uh, are very much dip slip. So they're pretty steep. And you see sort of extensional kinematics. This is the other thing that you see a lot of um, in that sort of west, especially where the S1 foliation um, and early compositional banding is steep, is these recumbent folds. And if you look at um, these folds, they're on all scales. They go from, um, they can be 30, 40 meters wide, big. We've sort of mapped them in some of the sequences to the, to the sort of smaller scale. But they're all dipping uh, moderately gently to moderately out to the west. So that's actually giving you a west side down uh, movement sense. If you think of them, they're drag folds. So that whole sequence is sliding down. As it's sliding, it's very ductile, and these things are like toffee. They're just rolling down. It's almost like soft sediment deformation. These things just sliding off. And the best way, if you look at just the, the fold axes, the F1 fold axes, you can't separate them from F2 fold axes. If you, you know, they're all pretty much parallel. So what you do is you use the, the fold axial planes because that tells you the attitude of these folds is markedly different to upright F2 folds, and that's how you separate them. Um, I'll show you in the next slide. Oh, I'll just I'll show you, because yeah, your F2 folds, that's your typical actual plane, it's just about vertical. So that's the best way if you're worried about separating your folds out. I always think, can a fold, how, how does a fold form when you're uh, horizontal compression, um, east-west compression, you just know if you're scrunching anything, it's going to be upright. Whereas these are all laid over, so it's, yeah. But um, if we think about those, S, those D1 fabrics, 
and the, the D1 shares that I'm showing in red here, um, I think a lot of the architecture of the Agni district actually developed during that D1 event. And our D1 event, I think, is basically the granite coming up and the greenstones sliding off. So I think a lot of that architecture is reflecting that early event. And all we do with later compression is just reactivate what's there already. So we've already got that dome is coming up and then we, we, we're basically scrunching it and reactivating all of those shears um, and forming these big synclines. And F2 folds are common everywhere in the eastern gold fields. It's, it's the most common fold that you'll see. And they're always they're, they're upright, um, north, northwest to north, northeast trending. Um, they're so common. In this case, that's in the New Holland mine. We've got the bedding is being folded by the upright folds. But here at the Songvang pit, that is actually the S1 foliation that's in the Mafix sequence that's being folded by these upright folds. So, and again, like I'm saying, it's use the actual planes if you're trying to separate F1s from F2s. D3 event, if you think of, um, we're basically, we've got horizontal compression, we're squashing the eastern gold fields. What I think of is, um, especially when you do regional mapping, the folds lock up and they, they can't fold the sequences anymore. And this is when you start to develop your shears, your big D3 shears, because the, the sequence hasn't got anywhere else to deform. And we see loads of these um, sinistral shears throughout the area, um, generally um, north-south to north-northwest trending, but they can be any orientation really. It's, it's, if, you, if you think of what's already there, you're just gonna basically reactivate whatever you can. Um, but you, see, you get good, mostly sinistral kinematics on these, but not everywhere. The Warunga shear has very good dextral um, kinematics, but I think that's the, still the same event. It's just a block of rock, the Scotty Creek formation going south, and you have shears either side of the basin. So, um, but overprinting, overprinting, and I've got good evidence underground. These dextral northeast shears that um, Swagger basically put into the D4 camp. They, I've got good evidence underground that these always overprint the D3 shears. So I'm quite happy that these are D4, um, and they're generally uh, northeast trending, um, and you see dextral movement on them, like we do in Kalgoorlie and um, you know St Ives or the Alpha Island Fault. It's yeah, it's a very common feature. So now I'm just going to quickly talk about the the, um, the Scotty Creek Basin because both of those deposits that we're talking about are both, are both hosted in these late basin sediments. Um, and on most maps, the Scotty Creek Basin is shown as a simple syncline, north-northeast trending, syncline axis down the middle. But when you, um, when you go on the ground there, there's the edges of the basin. There's vertical beds trending straight across that syncline axis. So something, is, something doesn't fit. You can't do that with a, with a syncline. Um, and looking north, there's the, the, the northern end of the New Holland pit. You can see the vertical beds, and they're just absolutely tram tracks north-south. And they go straight over that syncline axis. So this started a, um, a major sort of mapping and relogging um, exercise to look at younging directions and all the drill core. We were masses of drill core through this basin. Um, basically try and work out the geometry of this basin and, and make sense of that pattern because it doesn't make sense right now. So. And this was the outcome of that study. Um, so instead of just a simple syncline, what we found is that we've got parasitic east verging folds coming up the, um, the Lawler's anticline. So there's the anticline there. And that accounts for, you can actually do it then by having parasitic folds. It gets around the problem. But also on here, um, I'm just showing those fabrics I just talked about as a summary diagram. You have the layer parallel foliation that's wrapping around the, the granite. So there's your S1, which is sort of, it's, it's sort of an S0, S1 composite fabric, generally, but it's, it's wrapping around, layer parallel around the granite. And over here, when you go up into the basin, the dominant fabric is bedding. You hardly see a foliation there. It's, Occasionally you might see that upright S2 foliation, so bedding is, is pretty undeformed. Um, but the folds then are folding bedding here, but up here and sort of down here, they're actually folding the composite S0, S1 fabric. So that S1 fabric is like a local um, fabric, and that's what you see when you're mapping elsewhere in the eastern gold fields. S1 is not developed everywhere. It's more like a layer. Some layers are more susceptible to it, and then you'll, you'll go into a lot of zones with a lot of S1 and, and recumbent folds. Elsewhere, you don't see it. So it's just sort of like a local deformation fabric. 
in this case, it's, it was really obviously local, attached to that sort of where we're shearing off our greenstone sequences. So now let's look at the Warunga deposit. So we're here. We're basically the MU shear runs through there. That's the sort of the eastern edge of the Scotty Creek Basin. And this is sort of looking at all the loads. I find this diagram a bit, a bit sort of misleading because those loads, they're actually, the, the shears have formed as uh, layer parallel shears between various units, ultramafic conglomerates, Edmund Sandstone and the ultramafic unit below. Um, but the loads are sort of high grade, um, sort of thicker zones within that shear. So if you like, they, they're all part of the same plane and you've just got high grade zones. They're not separate ore bodies. It's just, it's, if you think of it as a single sh a shear and these high grade zones within it. So, so this is what they sort of look like. That the loads can range from any, anywhere from sort of 30 centimetres to 30 metres wide, um, highly variable. Um, we see lots of, sort of layer parallel shearing. Um, you, you see a lot of evidence for progressive deformation with the earliest formed uh, breccia veins becoming strongly sheared and laminated um, with the later, later ones starting to deform. But what we see is these early sort of recumbent folds all the way through the loads. Um, and we see a consistent like this west side down kinematics on those loads. So the loads are sort of forming as extensional shears. Um, there's some sort of visible gold. We get a lot of visible gold in the strongly deformed quartz. Um, that's, the, that's what the sort of S1 fabric looks like. And it's actually, it's a, it's a bedding parallel uh, foliation. Um, so it's, we just call it compositional banding, but it's, that's typically what we see. Um, those are actually chert glass we get like away from the, the immediate shear, the rocks are actually not that deformed. They're very cooked up and metamorphosed, but they're actually not that strung out. Um, but typically in the loads, we get these recumbent sort of folds coming through, but the, the recumbent folds are really well developed in that, um, the compositional banding. And um, one of our senior mind you, is, actually she's at Gruyere now, but uh, she did a really detailed interp. This is the Kim load, because along a single drive, it can go from this thin boudinage shear to something like this. It's a couple of meters thick, and it's, she wants to understand what, how does that happen um, along one structure. So she, she did a very detailed um, grade control program and, and interpreted that um, and found that the actual layers, that big blowout was actually on a major recumbent fold in the compositional banding. So that makes sense, because if that compositional banding is sliding down, you are creating space. So you're going to have a, great, a lot more dilatancy in that zone. Um, so I just did a mock-up um, little sort of diagram to show you. But it's, I think it's important because it's linking uh, those thick dilational zones with the actual extensional shearing. So it's telling us that it's, it's actually coming in during the shearing. It's not a later, a later effect. This, this was really interesting, because I was looking through, I was going through all the level plans, and I found this one. The Kim load is showing in that sort of pale blue coming through here. So we're looking out to the Scotty Creek Basin. So yeah, this is north. It's coming down through here. And I notice it's all folded. Um, and they've drawn the folds. And uh, we got underground to a place similar to this. And there's, there's one of the loads. And it's absolutely folded by upright north trending folds. So it has to have formed prior to our folding event. Um, so again, it's sort of it's pushing it back. It's pushing it back into something early. We've got it sort of extensional shears. We've got it f being folded by the, comp uh, the the F2 folds. So it's it's making it look early. And the, the actual fold vergence of these folds is climbing up the Lawler's anticline, which is sitting over here. So the vergence is right for that um, large scale fold. And if as you're going out of the pit at Warringah, that's compositional banding, and you can see um, an F2 fold climbing up again, climbing up the Lawler's anticline, which is over here, about two kilometres over here. So you're seeing it at all scales, and you start mapping, you see more and more of them right through the mine. And then there's one final feature on um, Warunga that I think is really interesting, because to me, I'm really puzzled why you'd have these thick loads within a shear. Why, why, why does Kim load sit there? so thick and, and so well mineralized. Um, there's low grade mineralization between these shoots, but it's, it's just the tenor is so much less. Um, and for a long time, the, basically the miners have, have basically tied it to the 340 faults, which is the mine grid for north. So 340 is north. So, and I totally agree. I think they are 
basically located on these faults. They're, they're cryptic faults. You, don't, you can't walk up underground and see them, but you can see them in gravity and the magnetics. They show up really, really well. And the other thing we noticed, I've actually asked the guys to um, build an isopack model of the Edmund sandstone, which is the, sort of the siliciclastic unit um, where the, most of the gold is sort of associated with in, the, in that sort of sequence or close to it. And what we found is that the, um, the thickness of that unit changes dramatically. It's not spread out and sort of distributed. So I've done a, a, a cross section through the model, which is there, and that just shows you, in the Edmund sandstone in brown, that just shows you how quickly that, that package is thickening. And so what I think, across those 340s, what I think is happening is that we have original basin growth faults that are preserved, so part of that sequence is still there. Even though we've shuffled it, we've, we've, we've um, slid things around, and we've metamorphosed it, and we've, we've basically flattened it, um, I think there must be an element of the original basin um, geology there to otherwise, you know, to explain those thickness changes and the fact that your loads are located along these structures. Plus, you see this dramatic uh, change in geometry there in direction of the load and that also fits with where these thickness changes are. So I'm always looking for extra controls. I want to know why our, lo our loads and shoots are where they are. So we've got to think about other controls. Um, and early growth faults don't go away. They just they get shuffled around but they remain as excellent fluid conduits. So I've just, yeah, I just mocked it up there, sort of roughly to show, because if you imagine you've got all these sort of early faults and then you, you're shearing over the top of them, they're going to act like sort of tears in the shear that the fluid can come up. So, In the hanging wall of Warunga is a different style of mineralisation. These are called the bears loads, these, um, these little late, late veins that cut across the loads and cut across the bedding. This is much more similar to the New Holland style of mineralisation. And they, they always cross cut the, um, these loads. You also see um, a bit of shuffling later. Um, there's like a fracture cleavage coming through and these sort of faults coming through. The offsets aren't huge, so it, it tells me that we're not seeing massive strike slip displacements along the Emu Shear. We're just, it's just shuffling because, you know, that's only a couple of metres offset. So that, that's the Warunga deposit. Now we're going to go across to the New Holland deposit, this whole trend here. And basically, it's about a 300 metre wide mineralised trend of gently east and gently west dipping loads, sort of gently flat lying, um, and they're called easterlies and westerlies in the mine. This shows it. It's generally, um, the loads are formed in a vertical sandstone unit where it, where it sits adjacent to a, a mudstone unit, so you've got a very strong competency contrast. Um, the loads are generally flat, but we also have uh, the Cinderella deposit, which I'll just back to this one. It actually sits, it sits off that main mineralised trend and it, for many years we never looked in that area but what we've found is that that is actually in a little, it's in that parasitic fold hinge in the anticline. So it makes a lot of sense, you've got an anticline, anticline of sandstone and you're compressing, it's, it's going to crack open. Generally um, these loads are sort of generally sort of, well 50 centimetres to a couple three metres sort of thick. Um, they always uh, sort of gently to moderately dipping and they always cut across the beds and very sort of brittle style. Um, in places you actually see them cutting through the fold hinges. So um, basically it sort of suggests that the folds are there and then they're breaking the weak point which is the hinge. And if I go into this one, this is a good one, you can see the bedding coming through, there's a bit of a fold coming there but it's, the loads are cutting across and it's really, they're really quite spectacular because I, I like sort of the brittle systems like this because you can actually see the movement sense just by looking at the wall. You, you can see the main load, it's coming through there and you've got all these extension veins or wing veins. I call them wing veins if they're coming off the load because you can actually use those and it tells you your kinematic sense. I've just shown it in a little diagram down here but you put your arrow into the wing veins and it actually tells you, if you imagine above the load the hanging wall the hang wall is moving and it's cracking that rock um, and that's, that's where the wing veins form. So as, many, as soon as you look at that face you can tell which way that rock mass has, has moved. So it's a, it's a useful thing underground it's, yeah, when you're trying to track these things. Um, the, the average, obviously the average orientation of these loads is, is north-south striking and gently east and west dipping. That's telling us that um, We've, they've formed during east-west compression, so we have a vertical sigma-3, um, horizontal sigma-1, um, as you'd expect. And at depth, 
in the Sheba zone, what we're seeing now, right at the bottom of the mine, or maybe it's not the bottom of the mine, we've got to keep going, but um, <laughs> so the loads are actually starting to crumple. Um, and it's bad enough that it's, it's, it's getting difficult in places to mine, although now the resource guys are actually building those fold hinges into their resource models, and it's helping a lot. Um, but it's bad enough folding that it goes into the backs, and then you lose the load, and then it comes back to the floor. So it's, it's, it's annoying, yeah. So obviously those loads at depth formed early, um, and then with progressive formation of the deposit, and you're, you're compressing the whole thing, they start to buckle. So there's a timing relationship. And through the New Holland deposit, we don't see a lot of faulting. It's actually, it's amazing. It's actually quite underformed. But where you do see a fault, it's, it's quite well developed, um, you know, a metre wide with good cataclasite. And they're generally um, at a high angle to the load, so they cut right across. Um, and there's a bit of quartz finding associated with them as well, and that they're cutting across our, our flat loads. And it's quite interesting, talking to the resource guys, they say when they're modelling the loads, quite often they can't take an individual load across these structures. And there's often, um, suddenly there'll be maybe many more loads or the tenor changes across these faults. And I think that, that is actually a really, uh, I think it's a clue that these are acting as transfer faults during a strong east-west compression. They would provide an excellent fluid conduit. Um, and you can see from the, the figure here, you know, you actually see these quite changes. There's probably another one in there, but you know, th there's quite a different zone to here. There's also subtle um, changes in strike in the loads across these things, so it's telling me that this, these were pre-existing. Maybe they were pre-existing um, before the basin, as the basin formed, who knows, but they're still there and they're important. And the other thing, the final um, deformation that we see at New Holland is this late overprint. And I've seen this in every underground mine that I've mapped in, um, in the gold fields, is that you get this late shuffle. Um, it's not those late extensional faults, but there's actually a late strike slip sort of shuffle. And this probably was one of the nicest examples. Again, you can see from the wing veins that that load was top to the north as it formed. It's, think of the cracks, it's cracking open. Then these faults, they're actually, there's actually shear planes going through the quartz. Those faults actually have the opposite sense of movement. So it's telling us it's, it's, it's a different event. And you can see sort of the drag it's actually, you can see the way it's moving, it's actually the opposite to how the load formed. And basically that, those dextral sort of normal faults, I would put well and truly into the D4 event. So, because our D3 event I think is when the loads are forming, during that strong compression, we've folded everything and then we're, sh we're shearing and cracking open things, and these are overprinting that, so I'd put them in D4. So now I'm just, the final um, deposit I'll talk about is Songvang, which is just down here. It's about 14 kilometres south of Warunga. And this is a very interesting deposit too. It's got some really interesting features. It's basically, it's a, it's a large D1 shear that's located, I'll just go back to this. You can see it's located right on the, the, that western edge of the granite complex. So it's an, it's an interesting location. And the mine itself, most of, the, most of the shear that's mined is a D1 shear in the pit. Um, you can sort of see it in the cross section there. So it's basically on the edge of the granite, it's just sliding off. But on the western edge of the pit, we have all these sort of shears coming through and the, the loads are modelled as the west loads and they're completely deformed and boudinaged and cut up, very different to the main, the main load. Interestingly, in the, um, the, 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 uh, the Song Vang Tonalite, the, the actual the granite right down in here and the guts of it actually becomes, it gets stretched out like toffee, it becomes an L-tectonite. So it's so linear, it's amazing. It's, yeah, you don't see those very often, but it's really beautiful. That fabric, that goes right up through the matrix sequence that sits above the, 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 the uh, granite. This is the, the granite here, and you're still seeing it right up at the surface, so it's, it's quite a penetrative fabric. And I'll, I'll get back to that, uh, the lineation. So standing up here, looking along that contact there, you can see there's the granite, and you can see that steep edge of the granite there and the shallow top. Um, and then if you zoom in here, you can see that early compositional banding that we see at Warunga also showing those recumbent folds. So very similar to what we see at Warunga. Um, and to me, that looks like it's, again, sliding off that granite. And if you go around to this point here, that's the S1 foliation in the Mafic unit. And again, folded by upright F2 folds. So we're seeing that same repeated pattern of deformation. And it's really interesting at Songvang, in, in that, um, within the D1 shear, 
um, uh, a recent paper by Thabo et al. that came out last year, they've actually dated the, uh, some hydrothermal titanite that's aligned with that L1 stretching lineation, and it's come in at 2661 uh, million years, which is, a really, is really interesting because that shear, it tells us that shear in the mineralising event is 20 million years younger than the age of the, um, the Songvang tonalite. So it's telling us that that fabric that we're seeing wrapping around that granite, that's not an emplacement fabric. It's a solid state fabric. That granite was already there and it's forming when we're sliding our, granite, our greenstones off it. So it's 20 million years apart. And the other interesting thing is about that age is that that's similar to the deposition, it's a bit younger, but it's similar to the deposition age of our late basins. So it's telling us that we're not only are we sliding our greenstones off these granites, we're dropping um, these basins are forming rapidly, filling with detritus, and we know we exhume our granites because we've got granite clasts in our late basins. So it's, a, it's part of a very big active tectonic process. And it's also a similar timing to the intrusion of the lawless tonalite into the, into the hinge zone. So we've got um, sh extensional shearing, we've got uplift, we've got the, uh, the late basins forming, and we've also got intrusives. So it's, it's a really interesting time. So just to summarise that, um, I think what we have is an early mineralising event in D1, when our granites are coming up and we're exhuming our granites and the greenstones are sliding off, and we have those very ductile um, sort of structures. We then fold our entire sequence, so we have upright F2 folds, and then overprinting that folded sequence, we know we've got vertical beds at New Holland, we have this continued east-west compression and we have those flat loads forming, and they cut across the already folded beds, so we know it post-states that folding event. So we have one prior to the folding event and one after. So it, it basically says two mineralising events about 20 million years apart. And I've just got a series of quick cartoons to sort of summarise the deformation sequence and mineralising, mineralisation. So I have a, a cross section, so it's looking north, that goes through the guts of the uh, basin. Um, so here's our sort of our DE event. We have stage one where we're, we're dropping our, um, we're opening our basins and our mafic, ultra mafic sequence is being deposited. Then we start forming our, our Vivian sequence on the Mount White Basin, and we know our Scotty Creek formation sits directly on ultramafic sequence. So we know that that area on the west was uplifted and it was being eroded off, but our, our Mount White sequence was dropping down at that same time. So we have like two stages of extension. Um, and then this is where I think this is when timing is telling us that we've got our we're uplifting our granites, we've got our intrusion of the lawless tonalite, we're dropping our we're opening up our lake basin, and we're also sliding our greenstone sequences off that rising granite. So that's our D1 event, is Warunga. We then fold our whole sequence, so we have a, our D2 event, and then overprinting those folded beds is our New Holland style mineralisation. So that's why I have that sort of as a, a D3 event well a bit later. And then this is the present day. To summarise, I mean, but it's really interesting when you look at these um, uh, diagrams by um, Carnotta et al. and Richard Blewett and those guys, they basically summarise all of the tectonic event features of the Eastern Goldfields. And that's a really good diagram because there's our stratigraphy. Um, there's the granite chemistry where we change from dominantly high calcium to low calcium granites. Um, that change is sort of happening at the end of our sedimentary record, but I think the, the important thing here is that I think we have a long, long, long history of extension that ends with our D1 extension event, and then we switch to compression. And I think that would be the best explanation of why our granite chemistry changes and why our sedimentary record stops. So I think what we're seeing is a major change in our tectonic regime of the eastern gold fields, and our, the ages of gold deposition basically straddle that. They go right through. Um, and this has been shown at the Golden Mile. I know Bateman at all talk about protracted gold deposition through all of the deformation events, D1 to D4. So we're not seeing it in isolation. Leonora, you see it, re really good evidence of D1 um, extensional gold. Um, and at, in La Laverton District as well, we see it at Lancefield, there's good extensional shears. So I think what we're seeing is it's, a, it's an eastern gold fields wide um, change in tectonic processes. So early, I mean the Archean is probably not your horizontal tectonics at, at the early stages. There's probably the, our granites coming up and down. Thank you.